actually, the first day people hardly knew he was there. The milk had unfortunately been too strong for his small stomach and the whole day he lay there like a dead thing with me forcing a mixture of brandy, warm water and sugar down his throat at regular intervals and waiting for the end. The next day, however, Blondin felt much better. Halfway through the morning, there was a screech like a train whistle from under my feet. And when I touched ground again and looked under the desk, there was a small brown head regarding me indignantly from the folds of the blanket. Where, he demanded men menacingly, rattling his teeth at me in a way I was come to know very well indeed in the weeks that followed, was his brandy. There was no trouble in feeding him after that. Diluted brandy, cracker biscuits, mashed to a gruel with sugar and water. Blondin took the lot, sitting up to suck at it with both paws, clasped tightly round the teaspoon, and refusing, point blank, all our animals showed their independence at a dishearteningly early age to feed from the fountain pen filler we bought for him on the second day. His fame spread quickly once he was up and about. People came from all over the building to see him and hold his teaspoon. Others bought him pounds of nuts and were most disappointed when he didn't sit up and start eating them right away. Even the scream, which meant he was hungry, and which could be clearly heard halfway down the corridor, rapidly became part of the office routine. So much so, that when the clarion call sounded one morning while my boss, myself, and a rather important visitor were discussing early Virginian history, the only one who jumped was the visitor and he nearly went through the ceiling. I merely streaked automatically for the door while my boss startled the poor man still further by telling him I'd gone to feed a squirrel. It couldn't last, of course. It ended, in fact, the moment Blondin began to feel really good and realised what he was. Nobody, said one of my colleagues towards the end of the second week, while he frantically tried to extricate Blondin from halfway up his coat sleeve, where he had crawled by way of experiment and was now firmly wedged and screaming his head off, could like animals better than he did. But an office was not a place for squirrels. They ruined the filing, complained the, complained the filing clerk, and indeed quite a bit of our current correspondence had an odd octagonal look where Blondin had tried his teeth out on the corners. They upset the ink, said the junior, and indeed there was a large black splodge on the carpet where Blondin, looking hopefully for something to drink, and it had indelibly proved it. They were bad for his heart, said the boss, leaping madly from the door one afternoon, as Blondin, who had been idly chewing a pencil on my desk, loped light-heartedly across the floor and sat up right in front of it, just as somebody prepared to come in. Would I please, he said, leaning against the door jam and mopping his neck with a trembling hand while Blondin clambered happily up his leg to thank him, take my blasted squirrel home. Grandma was awfully annoyed when she heard about that. She wanted to go down and speak to my colleagues and I had an awful time dissuading her. They'd never get on, she said wrathfully, if they weren't kind to little animals. From what I could see, my immediate prospect didn't look too good if I was. Heaven would pay them out for it, she said, wagging her teaspoon vigorously in the air. Heaven would. At that moment, the small tawny figure which had been busy teething on the picture rail till it spotted the teaspoon, sailed gracefully through the air and landed on her head. And Grandma, who wasn't expecting him, nearly swallowed her pastry fork. She changed her mind after that. What that little devil wanted, she said, wiping the remains of her cream puff from her chin and glaring grimly at him as if he was suddenly a sprig of old Nick himself was a cage. For a short while, for his own good, he got one. He had by this time progressed to being able to feed himself. Not so politely as we might have wished, perhaps, 
At first we gave him his mash in a saucer, into which, the moment he saw it, he immediately jumped and got his stomach wet. We got so tired of continually drying his stomach out on a hot water bottle that eventually we gave him a cup turned on its side. He threw himself just as lustily into that, rolling and sucking noisily as he ate and getting himself plastered with mash. But at least he kept his stomach dry and at least he could feed himself. So we left him at home with his basket and his cup of mash and his drinking water. And the very first day he was left alone, growing more squirrel-like with every hour that passed, he climbed onto a shelf, chewed the paint off a tin and poisoned himself. We cured him that time with copious doses of magnesia. We were, said Charles, hammering fiercely away that night at a large packing case, which he was converting into a cage to prevent Blondin from attempting suicide the next day as well, getting to know quite a lot about squirrels. Not as much as Charles thought we did, I'm afraid, because he said a rhinoceros couldn't get out of that cage once he'd reinforced it. Whereas with Blondin, it lasted just until the end of the week. When we went home one night to find that he had chewed a hole in a corner, just large enough to squeeze his small fat body through and was regarding us complacently from the top of the cupboard. After that, he was never put in a cage again. Fortunately, he had learned his lesson about chewing tins, but he achieved other catastrophes with clockwork regularity. He went through a period of imagining that his tail worked like wings, so that he was continually launching himself into mid-air mid from the backs of chairs and falling flat on his face. Then, apparently, having decided that altitude might help, he tried it from the top of a six-foot cupboard and nearly killed himself. Fortunately, we were on hand to pick him up. His small button nose was streaming with blood and he had sprained his hind paw so that he limped for days. But after screaming hard for several minutes, he calmed down, drank a teaspoon of brandy and water with the air of one who hated the stuff but knew it would do him good, and decided to live. His next escapade was really spectacular, though his habit of sprawling in his mash at meal times, the fur on top of his head had become completely glued down with sugar mixture, which had hardened into a glossy cap and made him look like an advertisement from Brilliantine. We made several attempts at washing it off, but the gloss was immovable. Blondin himself spent hours vainly trying to comb it out with his claws, sitting up and twiddling away at his top knot till Charles said he found it was doing it himself when he wasn't thinking. Finally, however, Blondin's patience gave out. One day while we were away, he sat down and pulled the patch out by the roots. When we got home, he emerged from his basket to greet us, inordinately pleased with himself and as bald as a coot. This was before the days of Yule Brinner and we were terribly ashamed of him. People were continually asking how he was and it seemed such an anticlimax to keep producing a squirrel who looked as if the moths had been at him. It was weeks too before his fur grew again, until the wrinkled pink tonsure, which disconcerted everybody except Blondin himself, disappeared, and he looked like a normal squirrel once more. Meanwhile, he had progressed beyond the soft food stage and was at last able to eat nuts. At first they had to be cracked for him and he had no idea of storing them. But from the very beginning, there was an instinctive ritual about his nut eating. Always, however hungry he might be, he would carefully peel three quarters of the nut before he began to eat, spinning it, spinning it round in his paws as he worked. He always held it by the unpeeled portion and never by any chance would he eat the part he had been holding. When he progressed to cracking nuts for himself, he never discarded the entire shell, 
but used part of it as a holder for the kernel so that there was no need to touch it at all. He ate slices of bread and apple in the same manner, always discarding the part he had held. Tomatoes were his favourite fruit, probably because the first one he ever tasted was one which he stole himself from a bowl on the kitchen dresser. And these two he carefully peeled before eating. But far and away above anything else, Blondin loved tea. He decided that he liked it quite suddenly one morning at breakfast while he was sitting on Charles's shoulder. Without more ado, he catapulted himself down Charles's arm and dived headfirst into the teacup which he was just raising to his lips. The tea, fortunately only lukewarm, went everywhere, over Charles, over the tablecloth and over Blondin, who emerged looking as if he had had a bath, wiped his chin on Charles's dressing gown and retired blissfully to the back of a chair to lick himself dry. After that, he would leave whatever he was doing at the first glimpse of the teapot. And the only way to ensure peace at mealtimes was to give him a saucerful before pouring out our own. Only once, I forgot, and when I came in from the kitchen, our dear little orphan of the woods, as Grandma still persisted in calling him, was on the table, standing on his hind legs and hopefully pushing his tongue down the spout. By this time, Blondin was quite a sizeable squirrel and perfectly able to look after himself. The only drawback to his prospects of survival when we set him free was the fact that he was unfortunately not the rare red squirrel which his sandy baby fur had led us to believe, but had developed into a perfect specimen of the American grey. And as such, he was liable to be shot at sight by anybody who saw him. It was difficult to know what to do. He was so tame that we hated the idea of parting with him. And the fact that he was liable to be shot if he were at large surely gave us every excuse for keeping him with us. On the other hand, it seemed wrong to deprive him of his birthright. If he were to be shot, at least he wouldn't know anything about it until it happened. Meanwhile, he would have led a full life, climbing to his heart's content in the windswept trees, perhaps even finding a mate and building a dray of his own. Finally, we decided to compromise, to set him free, not in his native woods, but in the vicinity of the farm where we were living at the time, in the hope that we should still see him sometimes and that as everyone in the district knew him by sight he might escape the gun at least for a while. So one fine warm morning in July we carried him to the far end of the garden and put him gently on a tree trunk. He sniffed about him curiously for a moment, his whiskers bristling with interest, his tail bushed out and fluttering with excitement. Then like lightning, he sped to the topmost branches, chasing himself giddily round, giddily round and up and down until at last he had to stop and lie out along a branch to get his breath back. Sadly, we stood and watched him, waiting until he should take it into his head to make for the taller trees on the other side of the wall and pass out of our keeping forever. But Blondin didn't go. He romped and played in the branches until he was startled by a crow flapping its way briskly over his head. Then he was out of the tree, streaking across the lawn and hiding fearfully behind the kitchen door almost before we knew what had happened. He didn't like the idea of being a wild squirrel, he informed us with chattering teeth, teeth as we carried him back indoors and put the kettle on. He liked us and tea, and sitting in Charles's pocket, and sleeping in the wardrobe. He was, he announced, regarding us happily over the top of the biggest walnut we could find for him, going to stay with us forever. Chapter 5, The Story of a Squirrel. Blondin, sometimes we wondered if it was a result of the brandy, 
was not an ideal squirrel. He threw nutshells and tomato skins on the carpets. He was obstinate and self-willed. When a situation arose such as his deciding to spend the evening in Charles's pocket and Charles not wanting him to, it invariably ended in Blondin getting tough and threatening to bite, squealing with rage, battling tempestuously with his claws. Peace would descend only when he was curled cosily in Charles's pocket. With, with, presumably, it acted as some sort of radar device, his tail hanging down outside. With me, he preferred to be the other way up. He particularly liked me to wear a sweater when he would sit inside it on my shoulder with his head sticking out of the top. I cooked, I did housework, I answered the door, all with blonding gawking happily out of my collar so that I looked like a two-headed hydra. Not as Grandma claimed that he did it from affection, just so that he didn't miss what was going on. Blondin never missed anything if he could help it. As soon as he could climb, he had taken to sleeping in our wardrobe in a pile of Charles's socks in one of the pigeonholes. There he slept the night through, snug, warm, safe from his enemies, so secure that if we woke up during the night and listened, invariably from the direction of the wardrobe, we could hear small but distinct snores. As soon as dawn broke, however, Blondin was up and keeping an eye on things, hopping up and down the bed, peering into drawers, looking out of the window at the birds, and finally, with his tail curled, curled jauntily over his head, settling down to wait on top of the wardrobe, where he could spot us the moment we got up. Many a piece of mischief was planned from that little lookout. He was there the morning Charles looked at his watch to see the time, and instead of getting up straight away and putting it on, stuffed it under his pillow and went to sleep again. We overslept that morning, and when we did get up, we had to move so fast that in the rush, Charles completely forgot his watch. Not until halfway through a hurried breakfast, when he realized that Blondin was missing from his usual vigil by the teapot, did he remember it. And by that time, it was too late. When we rushed upstairs, Blondin had it under the bed, cracking it to get at the tick. He was there too, the day Charles brought home his new suit from the tailors. From his eerie, Blondin watched with interest, his head on one side, his tail curled into a question mark while Charles tried it on. He also watched with interest while Charles put it on a hanger and hung it inside. We did notice that that night he went to bed earlier than usual, but nobody thought anything of that. He often popped off up to the wardrobe by himself when he felt tired. And indeed, by the time we went to bed ourselves, he was already fast asleep, snoring away inside his pile of socks like a small buzzfly. It wasn't until next morning when Charles said it was a fine day and he might as well wear the suit that we discovered. What had made our little orphan of the woods so tired? Not only had he taken every button off the new suit, as Charles discovered when he went to put the trousers on, overcome with achievement, he chewed the buttons off all his other suits as well. There was no need to inquire which of us Blondin belonged to at that moment. He was all mine. He was always mine when he did anything wrong. The time he upset a bottle of ink, for instance, paddled in it, and then left a Chaplin-esque little trail over a shirt that had just been ironed. He was mine then, all right. It was a wonder he and I weren't sent to the zoo together. He was mine too, the day Charles locked the wardrobe to keep him off his suits, and Blondin, equally determined to get back in again, chewed a large chunk out of the door. I was out at the time. But it was my squirrel who greeted me on my return, chattering indignantly away on the top. My squirrel, Charles informed me, trying fruitlessly to fit the bits back in again, who, if he couldn't behave in a civilised manner, would have to go. Normally, of course, 
he was Charles's squirrel. And if he'd gone anywhere, it would have been over Charles's dead body. Circumstances altered cases too. When it was not Charles's watch, but my handbag that he chewed through. A neat semicircular hole in the flap to get at my fountain pen. There was nothing mischievous about that. It was just, according to Charles, an example of his intelligence that he should have noticed where I kept the pen and being naturally curious about it, used his brains to get it out. He was certainly intelligent, young as he was when we found him, far too young to have learned anything from other squirrels. He still knew instinctively when the summer began to wane and it was time to start storing nuts. He kept his in the hearth rug and nearly drove us mad by the way he had no sooner buried them and carefully patted over the top by way of camouflage than he got all worried because he couldn't see them and immediately dug them up again, turning them suspiciously over in his paws to make sure they were still intact. Actually, the last bit was due to Charles rather than, than instinct. Charles liked nuts too. And one day Blondin caught, Blondin caught him helping himself to a particularly fine walnut he had found under a cushion. Incredulously, he watched while Charles crept and ate it. His very own nut and never offered him a piece. Incredulously afterwards, he examined the nutshell before he could believe that Charles, his friend, had done this thing to him. After which it was entirely Charles's own fault that whenever he entered a room, he was tailed by a squirrel who leapt on guard as soon as he approached a cushion and who, the moment he went near the hearth rug, patrolled furiously up, up and down it, threatening to bite if he so much as moved a foot. He knew too all about building drays. We had at the time a bed settee which we sometimes used for guests and blonding when he felt like a nap without the bother of going upstairs often disappeared inside it for an hour or so going in by a private entrance of his own through the back one day seeing him drag in a tray cloth across the floor and finally after considerable effort getting that through the back as well we opened up the settee to find a sock a small screwdriver a dozen or so paper handkerchiefs which he had stolen from a packet in a drawer and a good half pound of nuts. The socks, the handkerchiefs and the tray cloth had been fashioned into a snug little nest in which, when we opened the settee, he was rather sheepishly sitting. The nuts were obviously siege stores. The screwdriver, we had been searching for that for days and Charles said he couldn't think why Blondin wanted that. I could, to defend himself when Charles went after his nuts. It was just about then that we bought the cottage. Not because of Blondin. We had been looking for one before he was even thought of. Though, as Charles said, it did seem opportune that we found it the week he ate the farmer's housekeeper's begonias. It consoled her a little anyway. It was a relief to us too, Blondin by this time, had the energy of a horse and teeth like a pair of pneumatic drills. We'd been praying for weeks that he wouldn't start in on the farm. Now, we said as we drove down the hill to our new home with Blondin in a birdcage on the back seat, for the life we had planned, digging the garden, entertaining our friends quietly, selectively, getting to know our neighbours not so quietly or selectively as we imagined, I'm afraid. On our first night there, we gave them the shock of their lives. It began by my having a bath and turning on both taps at once. A thing, as Charles said afterwards, that anybody might do, except that in our case, it caused the ball cock to stick in the tank and the tank to overflow into the yard. It continued with Charles, already perturbed by the rate at which the water was gushing into the yard, worrying about the boiler. A strange house, he said, a system we didn't understand. Heaven only knew how the pipes went in this old place. He, he thought we'd better take out the fire. 
we did, which was why that fire, not, which was why that first night, our quiet country retreat strongly resembled a scene from Frost. Water pouring like Niagara into the yard. Charles and I appearing alternately at the back door in our dressing gowns, carrying buckets of coal, which as soon as the wind touched them burst spectacularly into flame. Dramatic moments when, for so far as the onlookers could see, no particular reason at all. We pushed the buckets under the overflow with a shovel and doused them in clouds of steam. Nobody interfered, of course. One or two cars going down the lane slowed abruptly for a moment and then, in the manner of well-bred Englishmen, drove on. Only from the gate, from a little knot of awed spectators on their way home from the Rose and Crown, whose attention was divided equally between our activities and those of a large buck squirrel who was intently watching the proceedings from the kitchen window came any comment. Just one solitary, awestruck voice. Later, we learned it was Father Adams, but we didn't know him then. God almighty, it said. We stopped the overflow eventually by climbing into the roof and lifting the ball cock. What we couldn't stop, of course, was the talk that went on. At the farm, at least, people had known us before we had Blondin. And in the manner of village life, when we did have him, everybody knew why. All they knew here was that we'd arrived with a squirrel in a birdcage, that there'd been some odd goings on in our backyard the night we came, and that, the, the, and that we were quite obviously mad. It took us a long, long time to live that verdict down, if we ever did. Part of the trouble was Blondin himself, of course. We were so used to him by now that except for running when we heard him chewing the furniture, we took him quite for granted. Other people, even if they'd heard of him, didn't. Sydney, nervous as a hare when he came to work for us and obviously expecting us to start doing war dances round a fire bucket at any moment, nearly fainted in his gum boots when Blondin ambled over his feet carrying a screwdriver in his mouth. The woman who called for a charity subscription, telling us over a friendly cup of tea that she had a little squirrel in her garden too, who ate all the wallflowers, wilted nonetheless when she reached down for her handbag and encountered the tail of our little squirrel who was busily investigating its contents. Even the bravest of them who, when he came to supper, allowed Blondin to sit on his stomach saying that this was nothing to what he'd experienced in the colonial service, looked a bit shaken when he got a nut stuffed down his trousers waistband and a firm refusal to let him take it out. Safe from Charles in there, said Blondin, peering down the top and patting it affectionately in place. We retrieved it in the end by persuading our visitor to stand up and shake himself while Blondin clung, chattering protestingly to his stomach. But it put rather a damper on the evening. He never came again. When after a succession of incidents like that, we went home from the office one night to find that Blondin had vanished. Nobody was particularly perturbed. Gone back to the woods, they said, when we explained how he had chewed a hole under the kitchen door and squeezed his way out. Never see you again, was the gamekeeper's verdict when we asked him. If he did come across the squirrel on his rounds, not to shoot it, but to see first if it was tame. We thought that he was right. Blondin was a different animal now from the little squirrel kitten who'd been frightened by a crow. Tough powerful, well able to defend himself. What was more natural than that he should go back to the woods? Nor in our heart of hearts would we have wished to stop him. All we could do was to put away his nuts, move a pathetic half-eaten apple from the mantelpiece and wish him well. And that's where I'm going to leave it. <laughs>